Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will begin the uh, speaking and music program now. Uh, on your program, I believe it says that I'm supposed to uh, speak now, and I just want to make sure that we are very clear that today is all about the 10 men we're here to honor, and their names will be said during the course of the day more than once. The program says I'm supposed to do a brief history of the hunger strike. That's impossible. The hunger strike started about 800 years ago, and it ended in 1981. The hunger strike didn't come out of nowhere. It wasn't a group of guys in prison saying, let's go on hunger strike. We hate the Brits. It was much, much more complicated than that. The hunger strike was a culmination of five years of resistance to British prison policy change. In the fight for equal justice that started in 1968 with the civil rights marches in the north of Ireland, the British reacted as all colonial powers do, and they started just arresting and picking up people and putting them in internment camps without charge. It was mass arrest after mass arrest and people were riding away in cages. Somehow or other they thought that that would break the spirit of the, uh, the resistance. However, by the 19, early 1970s, these men and women were recognized as having what was called special categor category status as prisoners. In other words, they weren't put in a jail, they were put in a camp, they wore their own clothes, they could associate with each other, they used to have classes, they had uh, arts and crafts that they did while confined. They also had educational lessons, they learned military and political strategies. They also carved, hand carved hops and made wallets and belts and things like that. Later on today, you'll see a hop that was carved in Long Cash in 1973. But what happened was Margaret Thatcher's government in 1976 thought that the way to win the war would be to break the backs of the prisoners. And as a result, a new policy was instituted in March of 1976, which was called the criminalization policy. The British tried to say that these men and women who were arrested fighting for the right of an independent country were just common criminals, no different than a mugger, a raper, and they would go to prison in the same, under the same conditions. The purpose of this policy was to make the prisoners knuckle under and give in and stop their resistance. They wanted to separate the prisoners from the support of the community. The first pr prisoner confronted with this new policy was named Karen Nugent. When he was arrested and then sent to the prison at Long Kesh, he took his clothes off and they gave him a prison uniform. He famously said he'd never wear it unless they nailed it to his back. As a result, he was put into a cell naked, and the only thing he had in the cell with him was a blanket to wrap himself up in. As a result of his refusal to cooperate, he was denied visits, he was denied letters, books, etc., for being a non-conforming prisoner. Now, before too long, in a matter of a year and a half or so, there were nearly 400 prisoners doing the same thing in Long Kesh. That's the kind of unity and strength these men and women had. There were also women in Amar prison doing the same thing, although they didn't have to use the, the blanket, but they were denied all their rights as prisoners because they were non-conforming. Uh, it's important to notice whether I'm talking about the men or the women, more than likely, not any of them would have seen the inside of a prison if they hadn't been born into a society that suppressed them and oppressed them from birth. 
they fought back against colonialism, they fought back against imperialism, and they paid a terrible price. In addition to not having clothes on in the cell, they were brutalized by the guards. There was nothing for a cell door to open, three guards go into it and beat the crap out of the man who was in that cell to teach him a lesson, to make him give up the fight, to put on a prison uniform. The prisoners were beaten as they left their cell to empty their chamber pots of their bodily waste. As a result, the conclusion was made it wasn't worth emptying the chamber pots to get such a beating. They stayed in their cells. They eventually put their bodily waste on the wall, threw it under the door. This was called the no-wash policy. And it went on for more than two years. Hundreds of men doing this in the hate block prison. They were doing this for the sake of five demands. The first demand was that as political prisoners, they shouldn't have to wear a prison uniform. As political prisoners, they shouldn't have to do any prison work. They wanted the right to free association with other prisoners. They wanted one visit and one letter per week. And that because they were non-conforming, they didn't want more time added on, added on to their sentence. These demands were totally rejected. In 1980, this protest ex escalated to where seven men in Hates the hate blocks went on hunger strike. One man was very near death as Christmas came closer. There was a lot of pressure put on the prisoners to come off the hunger strike. Bobby Sands, who is an international figure at this point, was the commanding officer of the IRA men who were on hunger strike. He was the one who was negotiating the status of things with the British in an attempt to get these demands made. Certain promises were made to Bobby Sands and others that their demands would be met in time, gradually, little by little. Bobby Sands made the decision to end the hunger strike just a couple of days before Christmas. The man who was close to death, I think his name was McKenna, his life was saved. But as the days went on, it became more and more apparent the British were reneged on the promises and they were not going to give into the five demands. This demoralized and crushed a lot of the prisoners. But they felt the only option left was a hunger strike. They had tried everything else. And on March 1st, Bobby Sands went without food. And what followed from March 1st was 26 weeks of brinkmanship and a steady stream of coffins coming out of Long Cash. To put the lie to the British accusation that the hunger strikers and the prisoners had no support from the community in the north of Ireland. Bobby Sands was elected to the British Parliament and Karen Doherty was elected to the Irish Parliament while both were on hunger strike. However, these elections meant nothing to the British government or the Irish government. The last man to die on this particular hunger strike was Mickey Devine. He died on August 21st, 1981. After his death, the families of other hunger strikers began to take them off of the fast once the striker fell into a coma. The immediate family could make that decision. It became clear that the hunger strike had run its course the hunger strike was then officially called off on October 3rd. Pat Sheehan, who will be speaking later, was one of the men who was on hunger strike when it was ended on October 3rd. Now, we would like to have the Roll of Honor. Before I call the names, I have to say this. We lost a tremendous man this summer when Tom Kelly died on July 8th, 2022. Tom Kelly was a man from Limerick. He was a founding member of Irish Northern Aid here. 
And he also was a Republican through and through and through. And Tom was the only treasurer we ever had in Irish Northern Aid, honest as the day is long. And he also would read the proclamation on Easter Monday every year. And many, many times it was his task to read the Roll of Honor. I'm going to try to replace him here and certainly hope that I can maintain my composure for this. So here are the ten men. Bobby Sands, 27 years old, died on May 5th after 66 days on hunger strike. Francis Hughes, 25 years old, died on May 12th, 59 days on hunger strike. Raymond McCreesh, 24 years old, May 21st, 59 days on hunger strike. Patsy O'Hara, 23 years old, May 21st, 61 days on hunger strike. Joe McDonald, 29 years old, July 8th, 61 days on hunger strike. Six days on hunger strike. Kevin Lynch, 25 years old, August 1st, 71 days on hunger strike. Karen Doherty, 25 years old, August 2nd, 73 days on hunger strike. Thomas McElway, 23 years old, August 8th, 62 days on hunger strike. Mickey Devine, 27 years old, August 20th, 60 days on hunger strike. I know uh, <laughs> one of the men uh, who was mentioned uh, on the Roll of Honor, Ray, Raymond McCreesh, his brother Malachi is here today. Uh, another man that was mentioned, Bobby Sands, of course. His brother Sean Sands was scheduled to be here today. Sean Sands has been a huge supporter of this uh, monument a major fundraiser for us and he couldn't make it because of uh, the National Health Service rules and regulations in the north of Ireland but Sean sends his best to everyone that's here okay um, next we have uh, we're going to hear from the president of the Rhode Island Irish Famine 
committee, which is the location that we have here. I'd like to introduce President Donald Dagnan, who's going to give us a welcome from the famine committee to this site uh, and just to expedite things. I'm going to Thank you, Jim, very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Don Degnan, as Jim McGetford just said. The uh, current president and a founding member of the Rhode Island Irish Famine Memorial Committee. And I'd like to echo uh, everything that Jim McGetrick has said, and particularly his tribute to our dear friend and uh, colleague, the late Tom Kelly, who was also a founding member of the Famine Memorial Committee itself. Whether you come to us from the north of Ireland, our fourth green field, still in bondage, but not for much longer, or if you come to us from the Republic of Ireland, a mature Western European parliamentary democracy, or if, like me, you are a proud Irish American and a dual national, or if perchance you come here to be with us today from Ireland's immense worldwide diaspora, I bid each and all of you a warm and hearty welcome on behalf of the Rhode Island Irish Famine Memorial Committee, Incorporated. For more than 25 years, the Famine Committee has worked tirelessly to translate words and ideas into permanent monuments in bronze and stone that commemorate significant events in modern Irish history. Thus, in 2007, we created here the Rhode Island Irish Famine Memorial itself. In 2016, with the uh, assistance of our sister organization, the 1916 Committee, we created the Easter Rising Monument, which is also here at this site. That educational and evolutionary tradition continues today with the impending unveiling of the 1981 Irish Hunger Strike Monument by the 1916 Committee with considerable technical assistance from the Famine Memorial Committee. We have here today a very large crowd, so it's not uh, entirely likely that you will be able to spend a few minutes walking around the site after the ceremony, but if you are unable to do that, or if you come to us from overseas and you will be returning home soon, you can familiarize yourselves with all of the work that the Famine Memorial in 1916 committees have done and are doing by visiting our website, which you can find very easily by going to www.rifaminememorial.com. And the website is also listed in the memory book, which uh, I hope that many of you will receive uh, at the end of today's ceremonies. We are delighted that you have joined us here today. All of you have honored us with your presence. Uh, those of you who are local can obviously come back and uh, visit the Famine Memorial site at your leisure, and I would invite and recommend that you do that because there's a great deal here to read and see and think about. For those of you who will be leaving us and going overseas, you can keep in touch with us through visiting the website yourself, as I said. But as you go home, to the rest of the wider world, those of you who are not remaining here with us locally. As you go home, please know that all of Rhode Island's Irish community stands firmly with each and every one of you in our expectation of the achievement of an, a united 32-county Irish Republic, just as the men of 1916 and the men of 1981 gave their lives to promote, and all of us are as equally committed to the cause of that Irish Republic, to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare, and of its exaltation among the nations as, any, as were any of the men and women we are celebrating today. 
thank you again for honoring us with your presence. Please enjoy the rest of the afternoon, and we hope to see you back here again soon. Thank you.